Hi, I'm Vagran Cascadian. Uh, I do a small consulting business called IKEDEV LLC. And uh, I'm going to be talking uh, a bit about uh, how to use Debian on embedded systems and best practices to uh, uh, maximize your long-term uh, viability uh, with using Debian. Uh, I'll probably talk a little bit about some of the history of Debian. Uh, I'll be getting into uh, some of the norms in Debian and uh, some of the infrastructure in Debian to help get, kind of give you some pointers. Uh, I'll talk about um, some devices that I've kind of worked with getting Debian working on and kind of the, the successes, failings, and challenges there. And uh, I'll be talking about ways in which uh, Debian can be uh, the ideal view of how you should be doing this. And then I'll talk about some compromises you might want to make along the way that uh, might make your ideal view fit a little better with, uh, uh, with uh, some of the practical realities when people are making some hardware decisions. So uh, I, uh, when I started writing this talk, I realized I've been doing this stuff for 20 years. <laughs> Uh, which was kind of a surprise to me. Uh, I've been involved in Debian uh, in some semi-official capacity for about 14 years. Uh, somewhere along the way, I got stuck with U-Boot um, just because I asked to enable a board, and I've been doing all of the uploads for Debian ever since. Uh, and uh, I've been working a lot on the reproducible builds uh, farm, running a bunch of ARM boards uh, to rebuild all of Debian. And uh, just a couple of years ago, I got my black belt in Aikido. That may not seem relevant now, but uh, I'll work it in. So uh, Debian started uh, uh, almost 25 years ago, if I'm counting it right. I think it was later in the year. So. Uh, it has a huge repository of packages available from which you can just basically, uh, if you can run Debian on your system, you have access to a huge amount of available software in the free software world. Uh, not everything, but a lot of things. Um, it also gets uh, regular security updates for the stable releases, um, and it supports uh, quite a few architectures, um, including many of the architectures typically used for embedded systems. Uh, so um, so uh, as embedded hardware is kind of edged beyond the, the microcontroller era and onto uh, general purpose computers, um, we, uh, it, Debian becomes a lot more viable for systems for a lot of these strong reasons. Um, one thing that kind of sets Debian apart, oh, you can't see the top. All right, well, uh, there's a Debian social contract. Um, it kind of guarantees some things to the users. Uh, and these things, uh, uh, they're typically, uh, it's going to remain free. You can use it, modify it, redistribute it, and we'll get to that a little bit more later. Uh, Debian tries to give back to the community, tries to do so in a transparent way. And uh, we love our users. And there, there was a pragmatic, somewhat controversial compromise in Debian where officially, uh, everything in Debian is free software, but there's this little section we tend to shunt off to the side and kind of support it that includes some components that wouldn't fully meet Debian's typical uh, freedom guidelines. So the social contract, is, uh, not every distribution has a contract kind of like that. So they basically just say to you, this is what we're doing, this is why we're doing it. Uh, the Debian free software guidelines uh, kind of spell out what we mean by free software. Um, it includes things like using, modifying, redistributing the software. And this stuff can really help avoid vendor lock-in, which to, uh, to clients, sometimes that's really a valuable, valuable feature. Um, and it gets into some more details. Uh, and the Debian free software guidelines were used as the basis for the open source definition. Um, so they're, they're very similar uh, with a slightly different angle. Uh, but one of the things uh, that really sets Debian apart from a lot of distributions is they have a very strong policy. 
so it has the Debian policy, which really uh, describes uh, mandatory requirements in order for a package to be in Debian, and also best practices, which are kind of optional but strongly recommended or suggested practices you should do. So what this gives you uh, that not every distribution has is when you install a package from Debian, you know how it's going to behave. Or, and if it's not behaving that way, it's a bug. It's not some feature or it's not some, uh, uh, well, I wanted it to do that way. So things like packages can't overwrite the configuration of other packages. You know, you install a package uh, and it shouldn't break some other random package on the system. That's a bug. Uh, not every distribution really sees things that way, and it has some pluses and downsides to that kind of an approach. Um, but uh, the policy really uh, gives you a, a somewhat of a guarantee of how the system is supposed to operate as a whole, uh, which you don't necessarily see in a lot of other distributions. Uh, the release cycle has a number of kind of stable and stabilizing phases. So. Packages typically get uploaded to the unstable distribution, which is kind of a staging area where they migrate to testing. And then testing is uh, basically a work in progress towards the next stable release. And uh, once, uh, once all of the release critical bugs are sorted out in a testing release, it'll typically be uh, released as a stable release. And then it gets, uh, Roughly a two-year support cycle, and there, there are efforts to extend that for, uh, I believe, up to five years, and maybe even beyond that. And then there's the old stable release, which was the previous stable release. They typically have code names based on Toy Story characters, and they have numbers, which within the Debian community aren't really used a lot. Um, so having to learn all these Toy Story names may be a little odd, but uh, that's how it works. Uh, there are a huge number of derivatives and, uh, uh, or projects working within Debian as well, uh, such as the Freedom Box. Uh, but they're basically, Debian has formed this basis that can be reused uh, for other projects that maybe uh, have a slightly different goal than Debian, but the, the guarantees that Debian provides allow it to be based, uh, uh, allow it to be a really useful framework for other projects. Of note, since this is the Embedded Linux conference, uh, Armbian is a really interesting one. For the most part, it's just straight Debian with possibly a different bootloader and a different kernel. Um, so that's kind of, uh, uh, that, that, that's basically some of the approaches uh, we'll probably talk about in a little bit. Reproducible builds is something I've been really involved in. Uh, this kind of uh, is recently added to the Debian policy. And uh, this, this can ensure that a given package will actually, it, it gives you a trust path to figure out uh, when you're building this source code, it results in this binary. And it does that by having uh, arbitrary independent people able to review, uh, rebuild it and come up with a bit for bit identical uh, package. Uh, so that's something that uh, more and more distros are working on and that's really exciting. Uh, but they're not really there yet, and neither is Debian, but we're working on it, and we've come a long way. So in Debian, uh, related to embedded systems, a, a really important package is the Linux package. Uh, so Linux, uh, there's a tracker URL, tracker.debian.org, and that will take you to a web page which kind of gives you an overview of the status of Linux in Debian. Um, typically, the versions of Linux and Debian are, for the most part, taken straight from upstream, and then they remove some binary blobs, and uh, there are a few other Debian-specific patches, but for the most part, it's straight from upstream, and if you want to get any new features into it, first you have to get them into, uh, into an existing branch of the Linux kernel. Uh, I'm one of the, well, I'm pretty much the only current U-boot maintainer in Debian. Uh, so similarly, we usually backport packages from upstream, but, uh, but I have taken the liberty of occasionally testing patches out in Debian first uh, and then submitting them upstream. Uh, but typically, we really like to only deal with backports and not implement new features. ARM-trusted firmware has 
started to become a bit of a, a thorn in our side in Debian. Um, not, not because of anything inherent. The licensing actually looks pretty reasonable. But I haven't found many boards that actually work with the main, mainline ARM trusted firmware. Uh, and, this, um, and there are countless vendor forks uh, of this project. And uh, ironically, the first ARM trusted firmware that actually got into Debian is uh, one of the all winner forks of it. And this is really needed for just about all uh, ARM64 systems. So uh, that, that's a work in progress. Uh, would, really love to see, uh, would really love to see more work towards getting boards supported on mainline ARM trusted firmware. Uh, that would really make the world an easier place for Debian. So, uh, another thing that, uh, because Debian strips out a lot of the driver firmware binary blobs uh, without source code, uh, there may be incompatible licensing. Uh, some of these will be integrated into the non-free components of Debian, uh, but some of them aren't or aren't yet, or uh, they're not readily available. Uh, so these things, uh, how you install Debian is basically, uh, like many distributions, you can network boot it or boot it off an ISO. In the ARM world, in the embedded world, uh, maybe USB boot or off of a micro SD. Uh, we've got images for net booting, net booting or SD card images for uh, the ARM HF architecture. And really, we get down to the key things of it needs to be supported in mainline Linux, it needs to have a free bootloader, and it needs to have system or driver firmware available. So that's kind of the ideal world. We want all of these things merged upstream. So I'm going to talk about a few kind of case examples. Um, in fact, uh, this device I really enjoyed working with a, a long time. Uh, it's got a great keyboard. It's got these little mouse controllers. Uh, and it really, everything just fits at least my fingers quite nicely. But uh, I kind of got stuck in this cycle for a number of years where uh, it was based on a, a Linux 3.2 kernel. And at the time, that was the current Debian stable kernel. So I thought, OK, it's got a few patches, but uh, they're working on doing the right thing. So you know, a security update would come out. I would you know, rebase the patches against the security update. I would build it. I would test it. Maybe something wouldn't work. And then I'd have to do it again, maybe just two days later. And this, this started to wear on me. Um, but eventually, eventually, the SD card on which I was running Debian, it just failed. And I said, OK, I see that there's some stuff in mainline for the open Pandora. I'm not going to use this on this, this crazy old kernel anymore. It ceased to be a recent kernel. So the upstream support on the open Pandora, well, uh, because it is a small keyboard, it's got a function key to, to be able to get to a lot of keys. And that didn't work. The mouse nubs, I couldn't get those to work. Uh, the Wi-Fi didn't work. Uh, I, that's kind of hard to live with because it's not like there's an Ethernet jack on this thing. And USB still didn't work. I've never really had USB working on this thing, even with the image that it came with. Uh, and the U-boot support, uh, all you really had was serial console output, which uh, you have to like plug in an adapter. So if I need to like, you know, if I did a kernel update, I'd need to make sure, oh, I've got another computer on hand so I can do a serial update. But I've taken this thing traveling without uh, having to deal with a laptop. And I've done development work. I've uploaded packages to Debian that, while doing development on this thing. I mean, it's really a nice piece of hardware. I was really sad to give up on it. Um, but that's basically what I did. Uh, another board I started getting involved with was the BeagleBone Black a number of years ago. It used to run an Angstrom-based distribution. And for whatever reason, the main person maintaining that disappeared. And they're like, we should, we should give Demian a try. And uh, so somehow, I got involved in this. and. Uh, you know, they said, well, we've got patches based on the 3.2 kernel. 
And, and I'm thinking, oh, I've been doing that for my open Pandora. That should be easy. Uh, you know, and turned out they were for a different variant of the BeagleBone. I think it was the BeagleBone White. Uh, they worked, they had their own vendor fork of U-Boot. Uh, then I saw that U-Boot was supported in mainline U-Boot, but the version of U-Boot in Debian was several years old. So I was like, hey, can you enable this? And, and that's how I ended up maintaining U-Boot for the next few years. Um, but now uh, the support for BeagleBone Black is pretty good in Debian. Uh, they've got most of the drivers working. Uh, U-Boot support is reasonably well supported. And, uh, but the BeagleBoard.org foundation is still shipping their own image with a custom kernel and a custom U-Boot with a bunch of patches, which they've just recently tried to push some of upstream again. Um, so uh, the BeagleBone Black is actually turning out to be reasonably well supported in the end. Uh, it didn't look great at first, but they were doing the right thing, and uh, I, that's great. Uh, I also got a few of the, the little chip computers, which I don't know if you ever tried to do a search online for chip, but wow, that's hard to find. <laughs> um, so that was kind of unfortunate, although pocket chip was a little easier to search for. Uh, but uh, on the early models, which are the ones I got, because I got all excited and got on whatever crowdfunding platform it was and supported it, uh, but the NAND uh, is not really supported on mainline Linux, and it doesn't look like it ever will be. I would love to be proven wrong there. Uh, the vendor bootloader doesn't boot a kernel with a raw initRD, which some of the distributions tend to like that feature enabled. And this is a, this is a common thing in vendor U-boots is they won't They'll enable the, just the features necessary to boot their particular variant of the operating system. Uh, and then I don't think the mainline U-boot supports the NAND on board. And there's not really, it doesn't actually even have a micro SD card or anything. So you can boot over USB. And then you, the only file system you can get access to is a, like a USB stick or something, which makes it kind of hard to be a mobile device. But um, so this device, I don't know, maybe someday it'll, it'll improve. There are a few of them out there. Um, but these are kind of some of the stories that uh, they didn't quite work out. Um, or they worked out to some degree, or eventually they, they, they work out. So you get to a situation when you're developing, uh, when you're developing software uh, for a particular board or a particular system. Uh, you kind of get to a point where you have a choice. It's like you can either uh, engage the community, but that might, that might involve some sort of conflict, right? Like you're like, well, we need these features enabled. We need that. But what people usually do, uh, what, what projects often do, is they just run away, and they kind of go do their own thing in a corner somewhere. Um, but this has some drawbacks. I mean, I'm glad people aren't like getting, you know, Getting, getting all ready to do fisticuffs over, like getting their support for their board, you know, and fighting on the mailing list and creating lots of flame wars. But running away has its problems too. So uh, I, I, I like to propose a different, a different approach, um, and that's to engage, to be physically engaged uh, through like an art like Aikido or uh, typically. You're aware of the situation. You're present. You are fully present in the situation, but you blend with uh, the forces coming at you. You're involved. You are, uh, uh, you know, they'll, they'll grab your wrist, and you might do something you don't actually want to let go. And there comes a point where you just got to roll with it. You know, you got to be engaged, but you've got to just like move along. You know, work with what's there and uh, be involved. So I would like to propose. Uh, some kind of middle road approaches that, uh, that can help prevent a, a, a long-term long problems that we've seen from uh, innumerable boards. I just mentioned three boards, but. Uh, so the kernel is a really key component. I mean, basically, if you can boot a kernel on, on your board and you have Debian as a user space, you can run just about uh, any kind of board on that as long as it's supported in, uh, as long as it's an ARMv7 board or if you use the really old Debian ports, the ARMv5 port. Um, but uh, a, a nice middle road is uh, to basically take the Debian stable kernel 
and then uh, backport patches from mainline uh, to get it uh, supported. And I, there was a talk earlier where they actually talked about, uh, talked about how you, that actually optimized and improved their driver code by basically pushing everything mainline and then backporting the features. Uh, and that's a really uh, excellent uh, way to approach it. Um, and then you can kind of have a stable baseline from which to work from. Or, uh, or you know, do a custom kernel, uh, but continually have a plan for how to keep stuff working in mainline so that you never get stuck on an old version. Um, similarly, the bootloader, it, it's the same kind of thing. There are uh, countless forks of U-boot uh, for uh, tons of different boards. <laughs> But uh, in the end, that version, uh, every once in a while, we'll get somebody, we've been, I think U-Boot's been using uh, date-based versioning since 2010, 2009, I'm not sure. A while now, and every once in a while, we'll get somebody who comes into the IRC channel with like a version 1.1 something. Like, well, that's old. <laughs> and then with the date-based version, you can see, well, it's exactly that old, you know. Um, so we see even really new boards getting released with like versions of U-Boot from 2010. Um, so this stuff isn't sustainable in the long term. Uh, would really like to see people focus on uh, pushing things upstream. I've been, uh, I've been involved in some of that. Um, and then in the x86 world, a lot of people don't really even think about the firmware. They don't even have a choice, really. They're, they've got this BIOS on their machine, and you know maybe the vendor provides updates, maybe they don't. Uh, but it's a little different in, the, in uh, some of these embedded systems where you actually do get the source code to actually uh, replace your boot firmware. And uh, we should keep that current so that when unforeseen security issues come up, uh, we can actually, that, that require something at the bootloader or firmware level, we can actually address those issues. Uh, another thing, a uh, complaint I've heard about Debian is sometimes the packages are a bit old or a bit out of date, uh, or maybe not in Debian, uh, but you can follow the stable distribution with uh, selected versions of packages that are relevant to your particular use case, um, or you can include just a selected subset of packages that aren't yet in Debian, and that way you can focus on maintaining the actually value-added part of the product, whatever it is you're working on. And that, that'll give you a pretty good approach to uh, not overcommit yourself. Uh, a lot of these projects don't really need to maintain a whole operating system. There are lots of operating systems out there already. And I'm talking about Debian mostly because I know Debian. Uh, but there are other choices. And uh, um, really uh, focus on what is your particular uh, project's specialty. Uh, so by doing some of these approaches, uh, you can really bring that out. Uh, I'll talk a bit about the Debian community. Uh, there are over a thousand developers in some official capacity, uh, depending on what exactly criteria you're looking at, uh, and then thousands of additional contributors above and beyond that. Uh, for the most part, uh, individual packages are maintained by an individual or by a team, but it's not uh, an absolute. Uh, they're not the only people who can upload that. Uh, any Debian developer can upload any package in the archive, technically. There are some social guidelines around not doing that for anything, for any, re you know, for any random reason. Uh, you you kind of need a reason to do that, but in general, uh, in general, it allows some flexibility between main, uh, uh, targeted maintainership and uh, the broader, a broader realm where if somebody's on vacation, we can still get a critical security update out. Um, there are, of course, uh, online resources available, mailing lists, uh, which have historically had some reputation for being uh, massive flame wars, but I, I think uh, in the recent years that I've been involved, it's been less so, given a few uh, exceptions. Um, but uh, IRC is also a great place for more real-time communications. Uh, they're uh, irc.offc.net, 
or irc.debian.org, which is just the C name for irc.offc.net. But there are a number of Debian-based channels uh, on, on IRC. And then, of course, a wiki, which, as many wikis go, uh, it's not necessarily well curated. There's a lot of stuff that's quite out of date. Some pages are really well maintained. Um, so that's also one way that other people can get involved, is if you see stuff that's out of date, fix it. Um, that's a huge ethic, actually, in the Debian community. Is uh, it's, it's an ethic of duocracy. And that's uh, also something that can really, uh, if you're an outsider, it's not that hard to become an insider and guide Debian in the direction that's useful to whatever your project is. So there are numerous events. Uh, every year there's a Debian conference and a, typically hosted in a different city every year. Um, a few years ago we hosted it in Portland. Uh, this coming year will be in Taiwan. Uh, and then numerous uh, smaller mini conferences some of the mini conferences, like in India, are as large as the official conferences. But, uh, <laughs> uh, and then we'll have uh, bug squashing parties where uh, we might try and get a release out the door or trying to uh, move some new feature over uh, that, that's been lagging. Uh, so I, I kind of referenced this tracker. I just wanted to give you an idea of the kind of information you might be able to see like by going to that page. Um, so this is, for example, the Linux package. Uh, and it, it'll basically show you the versions of the package currently in Debian. Uh, gives you links to the bugs, uh, build logs, numerous other kind of quality assurance checks. Uh, so this is a really great URL to know if you're trying to, uh, if, if you are using Debian and you've got a particular piece of software in Debian. Uh, you can pretty much go tracker.debian.org slash package name, and it'll get you to a summary of information about that package. Uh, the web interface to the Debian bug tracker is actually read-only, <laughs> um, which, you know, uh, this thing, uh, I'm, I'm not sure how old it is exactly, but it was kind of around before this whole Web 2.0 thing happened. Um, and so basically, uh, you can browse the bugs and do all that sort of stuff. But really, when you get down to it, it's an email-based system, which for my workflow actually works really well. I can do things offline. I can queue up mails. I can develop bug reports. I can download all my latest bugs to annoy me uh, and then read them on a train or a plane or something. Um, so you can actually do quite a lot offline, uh, and it's a pretty simple format. I mean, you just email submit at bugs.debian.org, make sure there's a package colon and name of package in the, in the body of the message, ideally a version, and then there are numerous other kind of tags and flags you can set. But uh, so for some of you, this may seem like an antiquated system, but it, it still has a lot of merits. Um, and this is how you get information into the bug tracking system. So I've been uh, suggesting that uh, there are ways you can get involved in Debian. Of course, uh, you can report on features or bug reports. Uh, that's a pretty good entry level. Uh, that's certainly where I got started uh, some innumerable years ago. Uh, and it's really not that hard to become a maintainer or developer of a project within Debian. If there's a piece of Debian that is useful to whatever other project you're using Debian with, um, typically people are pretty happy to have help. And uh, as I said earlier, it's a bit of a duocracy. So those doing the work define what happens. I mean, so uh, if you need something done in Debian, in many cases, you can typically jump in and do it. Uh, so there are, uh, and if you've got a reasonable, you know, coding skills background or whatever, uh, if, you, if you're familiar with revision control systems and at least one programming language, you can typically jump in on some project and make a really useful contribution. There are also other ways for uh, non-uploading con contributors, uh, people who help with editing the website or planning conferences. Uh, there are numerous ways to get involved. But given that this is an embedded Linux conference, I figured it was maybe targeted a little more towards the technical end. 
And so if you already have a lot of those technical skills, uh, the process has been pretty streamlined uh, to help get people engaged. So uh, I think this talk was used in one of the slides, or uh, one of the, this slide was used in one of the talks I mentioned earlier. Um, so thank you, Wikipedia. Uh, but this is actually salmon uh, in the Willamette River, just like a few blocks from here. Uh, and they're, the salmon in this region, uh, there, there's a long history, thousands of years of salmon swimming upstream. Uh, they actually contribute oceanic nitrogen deep into the inland country. Uh, the forests of this region are basically there because, uh, partially, because the salmon kept swimming upstream and they would they, they grow up in the tiny little streams and then they swim out to the world and they do their interesting things, eating other ocean fish. And then they swim back upstream, die, and contribute everything back to the, the place where they were born. I think we should be doing this as, in technical projects as well. You know, uh, you know, maybe you need to go off and do something that's not quite appropriate for within Debian, but if you bring it back in, I think we'll have a whole cycle uh, that, that really, really can avoid uh, some of the problems that we've been seeing. So um, I'd really like to thank Linux Foundation for hosting this conference. They also sponsored the Core in Infrastructure Initiative, which uh, funded me for a lot of work on the Reproducible Builds project, which is sort of related to this. And uh, Debian, of course, and there are so many people pushing things upstream, and I want to just say thank you. That makes, uh, as a Debian developer, that makes a lot of my work a lot easier. Um, so let's see, obligatory licensing and questions. Uh, how does this work? I didn't know I was going to get a microphone. This is pretty cool. Uh, so you talked about some of the boards that were not working out so well. Uh, do you have any favorite boards that you like running Debian on? Oh, um, I've been really happy with the, the Wanboard series. Um, they've just been uh, on the reproducible builds farm. They're not the fastest of boards we have, but they've been really stable. Um, so that's one of my favorites. Uh, for a somewhat newer board, I just recently got a dev board from uh, Theo Brahma Systems. It's the Puma RK3399. And I haven't spent a lot of time actually working on it, but the board is really nicely labeled with like switches instead of random jumpers or having to short like connectors, which I've had to do with some boards just to get them to boot correctly. Um, so. But uh, probably the one that comes to mind first is the wand board for something nice and stable. Um, it doesn't really require much external firmware or anything, which is nice, and it works reasonably well out of the box on Debian. How many people have worked on a project using Debian? Okay. <laughs> I guess the title of the talk might have biased the audience a bit there. Um, cool? Yeah, yeah. Any, uh, any war stories from a project you're using Debian on? Or I see a hand back there. Hey, um, so I felt this talk was mostly about evangelism for Debian, but I was hoping if you had like some concrete points about um, best practices for Debian on embedded systems. OK. Like, what are the, some of the takeaway messages? The real takeaway is get your stuff upstream. <laughs> I mean, that's really, to a large extent, on Debian, uh, if you have upstream support in the Linux kernel, if you have upstream support in U-Boot, if you have uh, your boot, for, boot firmware available upstream, uh, Debian basically just works. So in that sense, um, yeah, I don't have a, a lot more to say. It's kind of stressing that point. Uh, and there have been a couple other talks talking uh, in a similar vein throughout the conference. So, uh, so yeah. OK, thanks.
So uh, if I want to use uh, newer stuff in Debian stable, there is something called backports.org. Can you speak about that a little? Sure. Uh, yeah, I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, that's kind of like an in-between place between uh, testing and stable. Um, so backports, uh, there's a backports.debian.org is a site where basically uh, they, they'll take newer versions from uh, the in-development release of Debian, the in-progress release, and rebuild it so that it's compatible with uh, Debian Stable. Um, so uh, I think even, I should have mentioned that more explicitly. Yeah, uh, so basically, yes, uh, I should have included a reference to backports.debian.org on this slide. Uh, that's a really great service. Um, you don't get quite the same uh, security guarantees with, with backports, um, but in general, uh, you get a pretty good process. And contributing to backports.debian.org is something you can really, uh, uh, a way to really help get all of your stuff uh, integrated if you do need newer versions of software. Uh, there's also a site called mentors.debian.net, or is it .org? I'm not sure off the top of my head. Um, that uh, allows you to upload packages and then request sponsorship for um, not just backports, but any part of Debian. So you don't actually have to become a developer in order to um, get things into Debian. Um, but backports is a great starting place where you can, uh, if you need to learn uh, the particulars of Debian packaging, um, that's a nice, easy way to sort of uh, contribute. Yeah, thanks. That was a great question. I should have included it in the first place. Thanks. <laughs> All right. Last call. All right. Um, uh, what can you say about uh, how to formulate this? Um, it can be frustrating to work with a lot of packages because the packaging format, as it's always been, is tarballs plus patches. Um, I know there's been, there was a, a, a Git variant of source packages for a time mm -hmm. that seems to have stayed experimental or died. Um, right. I know that a lot of Debian developers use Git repositories and this uh, new GitLab infrastructure is coming in place. Um, what's going on in the community these days when it comes to source package formats? And is there ever, do you think we'll ever see a time when the official source package format is a real Git repository like everything else in the world and not <laughs> something that's, you know, ultimately gets converted to tarballs plus patches, which are right. kind of hard to work with? Yeah, there is an interesting project called DGIT. I don't know if you've heard of that. Um, but that basically allows you to kind of do uh, that kind of a workflow. And then the packages that get uploaded as a result of that are, are then imported as like, I don't know if it's a commit or a tag in your Git branch. Um, but it basically uh, is a workflow uh, where you can basically just commit to your Git, commit, and uh, then you just you use the dget tool to upload, and then it'll prepare the source package. And it'll prepare all those artifacts that you don't kind of want to deal with. Um, so there are people working on other approaches. But yeah, the, the dget source, or the git source format is, as far as I'm aware, nobody's actively working on it. And like I said, Debian is very much a duocracy, and it's also Thousands of individual interests all kind of working together, but also kind of working independently, which is both a strength and a weakness of Debian. Uh, so I can't really promise you anything, any sort of timeline or anything. I, I haven't heard of anything in the works to really change that angle of Debian. But um, uh, have you seen anyone try? Has it been a discussion that resolved in some? You know, not in recent years. We have this general philosophy about it and. Yeah, and I haven't seen any recent activity on that. Um, but yeah, uh, I mean, the biggest change right now is we've, we're basically the only official hosted infrastructure is all going to be Git-based. We used 
people can still use whatever revision control they want, but the, the provided hosting infrastructure is just going to be git paste from now on. And it was the vast majority of packages already simply using git. So, so sorry to not give you better news, but no, I think that's the status of it. Thanks. Oh, uh, somebody mentioned git build package. Yeah, there, there are a handful of tools. There's git build package, there's git dpm, uh, there's dgit. Uh, um, and they all basically serve as a way to generate the tarball plus patches that we then upload to the archive and then the build machines go and rebuild all the packages. I've been given this microphone, but I think the speaker just went over what I was saying. So thank you. OK. Any other questions or comments or uh, hopes for the future? All right. I have a general question, since I'm already holding this, which is, do you think, um, especially given the slower release cycle of Debian as compared with many other distributions, I haven't gotten the impression that the community as a whole um, particularly values supporting embedded platforms which is just because the landscape changes a lot faster in the embedded world. Uh, do you think that understanding is accurate or do you think it's changing or so on? Well, what's really interesting about Debian's workflow is we produce this stable release, but the majority of developers are on a ro rolling release. <laughs> you know, so we kind of have a bit of both, um, which actually I think, uh, uh, can actually be a positive thing. It gives us the time to like really go over and make sure everything's complying with policy. You know, having those releases, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm very partial to a stable release. I, I kind of have a bit of a system administrator background, but I, I do think uh, Debian actually has a nice blend of the rolling release and stable release kind of format uh, because packages are constantly rolling into testing. Um, you know, it's maybe not a, technically a rolling release or whatever, but it, it has a lot of the same properties. So, um, so yeah, that, that, that's a whole nother approach. I was definitely recommending um, targeting stable and then basing your stuff on that just to give you, uh, so that the rug doesn't get pulled out from under you in the middle of your you know, development process. But if you would rather go with newer stuff, uh, definitely targeting testing or even unstable in, in some cases may make a lot of sense. Just as a response to the earlier question about Git, I know of two arguments against. Uh, one is that the cryptographic provenance checking for current tarball-based Debian packages is considerably stronger than that that's used for Git. And second is that when dealing with several layers of derivatives out of Debian, it is sometimes easier to rebase by having separate patches in Quilt than doing it in Git. All right. Well, uh, thanks for coming, everyone, and uh, hope you got something good out of it.